Good morning, Grove Church, and welcome to our online experience. It's Sherry Summers. And if today you are joining us for the first time, I want to welcome you. We are so excited that you are here, and we want to connect with you. Please go to the link below and fill out our online connection card and indicate that you are a first-time guest, and we would love to send you a gift this week. Today, we will be starting a new series called Stop Going to Church. In this series, we will be challenged to be the church, not just attend. And we're looking at our Grove family values. But first, let's start with lifting up the name of Jesus together. So get ready, church, because worship starts now. Yeah. 
church this morning we're going to sing a new song and uh, this song comes straight out of scripture number six verse 24 says may the lord bless you and protect you may the lord smile on you and be gracious to you may the lord show you his favor and give you his peace and this is our prayer this morning so let's sing this together you 
favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor Grove Church. Thanks so much for being here today. It's Sherry Summers, and I want to let you know about a few things coming up at The Grove that you might want to be a part of. 
Parents, Greenhouse Kids will be starting summer hangout on July 9th. Join us on selective nights this summer for free family fun. We have so many fun activities in store that you don't want to miss. For the full list, please go to our events page at this link below. Did you know that The Grove is opening The Grove Preschool? This ministry encompasses childcare for children beginning at age eight weeks through after school for school aged children through age 13. The Grove Preschool is a member of the Association of Christian School International. Our goal is to provide strong educational background while surrounding our children with love, support, and all based on biblical foundation. The Grove Preschool is set to open in August 2021, and registration and employment application are open now. To access those and for more information, including fees and our children parent handbook, head to thegrovepreschool.org. And as always, everything we talk about today can be found on the events page on our website or on our app under the events tab. Thank you so much for listening. Now, let's get back to our service. We wave high the flag of freedom as a patriotic reminder to never take our independence for granted. Fireworks explode into the night sky, lighting up the darkness, reminding us of our nation's calling in the world. One nation under God. We look into the sky and remember that for all the freedom we have to celebrate, we must never forget our dependence on God. It was by His hand we were afforded our independence. So we might stand for liberty, remembering He set us free from the bondage of sin. So we might stand for justice, for the Lord loves justice, and He will not forsake His saints. So we might stand for freedom, because we know that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We thank you, God, for the beautiful gift of our country. May we always depend on you to sustain us. Welcome to The Grove. Thank you guys for being here. My name is Brad. I'm the lead pastor here at The Grove. I just want to say happy 4th of July. We're so glad that you guys are celebrating with us today. We have a lot of fun things in store. We want to welcome our, our friends online and our friends in the chapel service today as well. Um, but as we celebrate the 4th of July, there's no better way to do that than to celebrate with Baptism Sunday. And so uh, today here at the Grove Church, we're celebrating baptisms. We have 30 people uh, going public in their faith with Christ this morning as we celebrate <laughs> baptisms. And you know, it's incredible that we live in a country. Uh, we live in a country where we have the freedom to do that. We get to come to church and without any type of fear of persecution or legal trouble, we can come and publicly uh, confess our faith in Christ. But what's even greater than that, what's even greater than the freedom of a nation is the freedom that we have in Christ and the freedom from sin. And what baptism represents is that we've, we've died to our old way of life, we've died to our sin, and we've been raised to new life in Christ. And so we're so excited to celebrate with each and every one of those individuals today and baptisms. But you know, 
I, I am energized when, when I come to church and when we come together as a community, whether it be on Sunday morning or Wednesday nights or different things we have happening throughout the week. I'm energized to be around other people who are, who are pursuing a, a life with Christ. And you know what's really saddening to me is as I read uh, different statistics and different things that in our culture, there's been a massive shift. And many of you guys have seen this, but, but literally uh, millions and millions of people are walking away from the church. And they're actually, their response is this, is that, you know what? I still love Jesus. I just don't like the church. And that's becoming a common response or a common answer in our country today. Uh, Literally, millions and millions of people are saying, you know what? I'm open to the idea of faith. I'm open to the idea of Christianity. I'm even open to the idea of the person of Jesus but I want nothing to do with the church. And really, uh, we know that where this stems from is that so all too often the church, our, 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 our walk doesn't match our talk. And so what our culture and what our community is seeing, they're, they're hearing one thing of what we represent, but they're seeing something different. And what they're seeing is a, a group of individuals that oftentimes... Uh, is very judgmental or very divisive, or we know the famous, you know, accusation of, of they're just a bunch of hypocrites, right? Hypocrisy. And so what we've seen is that, that through, through years and years and years and years of, of individuals not walking this out or living this out, but claiming one thing, but, but living something different, our culture is saying, you know what? Like, I'm okay with Jesus. Like, I, I'm pursuing Jesus, but I want nothing to do with the church. And that breaks my heart, man. It breaks my heart. And, and even, even this past week, I got to sit at breakfast with a friend of mine who's working through some really, really tough struggles in life. And he sitting across the table. He shared open and honestly with me and said, you know, Brad, like I just, I, I'm seeking Jesus in this situation, but I do not feel like the church is somewhere that I can be accepted. I don't feel like the church accepts me because of my past and because of my decisions. And, and he was bold enough to just say it right out. Like, I, I, I'm pursuing Jesus. I'm seeking Jesus and his comfort and his wisdom in this situation. But I do not feel comfortable in the church. And then sitting there listening to that is just like heartbreaking to me because I believe that the church is the expression of Christ here in this earth, that this is God's plan A and there is no plan B. Like, this is what he said. Like, I will build my church and the church will be the the messengers of this this good news, this life-changing message of the person of Jesus. You know, the Barna Group, maybe you've heard of them or maybe you haven't, but they're a large-scale kind of research group that does research uh, on the areas of, of faith and spirituality in church growth. And in 2017, they put out this study of the top 20 most unchurched cities in America. And you guys could guess, you know, you could guess those top cities of Vegas and in Seattle and in LA and in Boston and Portland, Oregon, these churches that we would kind of uh, stereotype as, man, you know, probably not real, real excited about the church or, 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 or morality or even Christian or biblical values. But I want you to look on there at number nine. Look who made the list at number nine. What Barna Group did was based on population, they made a triangle from Melbourne over to Orlando, over to Daytona. So if you kind of make a triangle, those three points, we're, we're right there, uh, coastal central Florida in that triangle. And based on population, we're number nine on this list. Top 20 unchurched cities in America. People that said, man, I don't want anything to do with the church. And this is eye-opening to me in, 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 in several conversations and meetings I've been in with other leaders and pastors. We've brought up this chart to say, man, there's a great need in our region. There's a great need in our community for the church and for the gospel of Jesus Christ. But this next list is even more staggering because the top 20 unchurched means that these people have not been to any type of church service or program in six months. But this next list is the top 20 most de church cities. And what that means is that these people were once highly involved in church and in the last six months have walked away and said, I want nothing to do with the church. So these aren't people who just have no interest or have had no interest. These are people who at one point were involved and participating in the work of ministry and now saying, I don't want anything to do with the church. And look what happened. 
We jumped the list. We went from number nine to number six to say, man, the most six most D church city in the United States is our coastal central Florida area right here, including Brevard County. You know, and as we, as we look at this list, we're thinking, what in the world? How do we make the list with Nevada? How do we make this list with Las Vegas and Seattle? Like these cities that we think of, like, man, like they're, 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 they're far from God. But here we are. And this is the reality. This is the reality of our region and, and where we live. And so what I want to do is I want to I want to challenge us. What would it look like? What would it look like if we begin to live out, not just talk the talk, but but walk the walk and we begin to live out the characteristics of Christ? What if we stop going to church and we actually begin to be the church? We actually begin to live out the church and, and what it looks like. To, to live the characteristics of Christ. And so these next six weeks, we're going to be looking at our family values. And so we have these values here at The Grove. And if you're uh, not familiar with them, you can check them out on our, on our website, our app. If you've been to Next Steps or the Partnership Party, we talk more in, uh, in, intensely about those. But these values are these behaviors or these heart attitudes that we say we want to embrace as a church, those individuals that say, man, I'm a partner of the Grove Church, like this is my community, these are, these are seven attitudes. These are seven values that we're saying, man, we want to live these out. We want to embrace these because we believe that these are characteristics of Christ, that these are biblical characteristics, and this is what it would look like to, to be the church. Not, not just what we do on Sundays at church, but how do we live our lives all week long in our community? And that's what we're going to spend the next six weeks doing and looking at. And we're going to uh, start, start being the church, not just going to church. But I want to start with this value of putting the interest of others before our own, or, or another way of saying it, to have an others first attitude. And if we're just real honest, this does not come easy. It does not come natural. It's about as natural as a fish riding a bicycle, right? And so putting the interest of others before our own and selflessly saying, you know what? Life isn't all about me, um, but, but Christ has called me to think about others first. This is extremely difficult, but the good news is that we have an incredible example of what this looks like in the person of Jesus and documented for us in the scriptures. And so I want to look at a passage. If you have your Bibles this morning or you have your phones, we're going to be in the, the book of Philippians. It's a small book near the back of your Bible. It's actually a letter. Maybe you've heard it referred to as an epistle, uh, but it's in a letter written, written to the Christians, the church, in, in a region called Philippi. And so that's why it's called Philippians. And so it would be much like if they wrote a letter to the Christians in Titusville, they would call it Titusvillians, all right? So it's not complicated. It's just to a group of people that live in Philippi. Therefore, it's called Philippians. It's written by a guy by the name of Apostle Paul. Paul was a Jewish Pharisee. He was a Pharisee. He was a religious of the religious. And, and his life goal was to make life miserable for those who were following the person of Jesus, this new way of life as disciples of Jesus. He was, he was extremely opposed to this life. And he was, he was overseeing the, you know, the, the, the imprisonment and the beating of these people who had given their life to follow the ways of Jesus until one day he encountered Jesus for himself. And he had a radical transformation. And Paul went from the person who persecuted the church to pastoring the church and writing two-thirds of the New Testament. And this letter, Philippians, is one of the letters that Paul wrote. He actually wrote it from inside a prison cell, writing to the believers of the church of Philippi. And what he's encouraging them with, he says, I want you guys to imitate Christ's humility. It's so important that we, we look at the life of Christ and the way that he lived out humility and that we imitate this humility. Look with me in Philippians chapter 2, uh, starting in verse 3 through 5. He says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, 
Paul's saying, man, like, this is what it looks like. This is what Christ modeled for us. And in, in our relationships with one another, we should have the same mindset, or your Bible might say the same attitude as Christ Jesus. How do we have the same attitude or the same mindset? Paul wrote another letter called Ephesians, and you guessed it. It was to a group of believers living in Ephesus, right? So it was called Ephesians. And in Ephesians chapter 5, he said this, imitate God. Imitate God in everything because you're his children. Be imitators of God. This is what he's calling us to. And I don't know if you guys have ever noticed how, how young boys love to imitate their dads. Anyone ever notice that? Like boys will imitate their dads and in every move. It's, it's for a season, you know, then they get to a season where they don't want to be anything like their dad. But, uh, and then it comes back around, right? But, but in that early season, those first 10 to 12 years, it's like, man, they want to do everything their dad does. They imitate their dads. And, and I'm raising my sons up right, and so I'm taking them to the gas station on a daily occurrence, right, and getting fountain drinks because that's what men do, right? That's what men do is we go to the gas station and, and we get fountain drinks. And, and it happens every single time. We get to the counter and I, I get my styrofoam cup. Everyone knows that, that you only drink fountain drinks out of styrofoam cups. So we get styrofoam cup and my son gets his styrofoam cup and we make our way to the counter and every single time, without fail, whoever's working at the register will say, hey, are we out of lids? No, you're not out of lids. We just don't drink with lids. We're men. And my son will say, no, we don't, we don't need lids. We don't need lids. And he's very confident, you know, like this is, no, I don't need a lid. I don't need, what do I look like a toddler? I don't have sippy cups over here. Like, I don't need a lid. And, you know, it, it never, never fails. He, he spills half of it between the cash register and the back seat of the truck. But he's imitating every move. He says, no, dad doesn't have a lid in a straw. I'm not going to have a lid in a straw. And you know what Paul's telling us? What he's telling the believers in Philippi and he's telling the believers in Titusville today? He said, man, if you want to know how to deal with life situations... If you want to know how to, to, to deal with the relationship situations you're working through and how to care for others and put the interests of others before your own, imitate Jesus. I mean, imitate Jesus. Imitate his every move. Watch how he did life. And let's imitate the person of Jesus. He goes on in verse 6 through 8 and gives us these specific ways, three specific ways that Jesus modeled this for us. If we're going to live an other's first life, if you're tracking with me in your program, write this down. The first thing we got to do is we got to maximize our view of God. We got to maximize our view of God. Look what it says in verse six. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Remember, he's talking about the person of Jesus. He says, Jesus, being in very nature God, he was the God-man. He was the God, he was God in the flesh. He was God incarnated, walking amongst his people. It says, Jesus, even though in very nature he was God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Jesus even recognized in his fleshly body that that. He maximized his view of the Heavenly Father. He maximized his view of God and said, you know what, I'm not, I'm not going to put myself on equal platform as God the Father. You know, we, we, we have to get into this habit of maximizing our view of God. Now, I know that none of us here would say that we put ourselves on an equal platform with God. Hopefully not. None of us, if you do, that's like a, that's a actually medical uh, condition called the Messiah complex, that people suffer from that, and they actually put themselves and think that they're a God. I don't know if anyone in here suffers from that, but most of us would say, yeah, obviously, I'm not God. I recognize that. I believe that God is much more powerful than I am. And we might not say that we're God, but in our actions and the way that we live life, we communicate that we are a God. Because anytime we think others exist to serve us, or for our purposes, or for our pleasures, what we're doing is saying, hey, we're, we're as a God. And we need to understand that we're not. That God is the only one worthy of being magnified at that level. God's the only one worthy of others surrendering and serving with their lives for him. Not, not for us, it's not about us. 
but we maximize our view of God and, and we help put things into perspective. When we maximize our view of God, it causes everything else to lose focus. But oftentimes in life, we maximize the wrong things, don't we? We maximize our troubles. We maximize our worries. We maximize our fears. We maximize the importance of money or of things. Or what about this? We maximize our view of ourself. And when we maximize any of these things, we can't experience the life that God has for us because our, our vision is consumed with things, everything but God. And so what we have to do if we have any hope of living an other's first life or an other's first attitude is we have to get in this habit and this discipline of what does it look like to maximize God, to recognize the power and the glory and the goodness of who God is. You know, I'm not, I'm not a real techie person. I'm not real into technology. I'm not very familiar with it. I'm definitely not uh, uh, good at it in any ways. But, but one of the things I love about these smartphones that we all carry around with us 24-7 is, uh, you know, th it, it became a time now in our culture where we all have phones on us all the time. Anyone else ever think about that lately? There was, a, there was a, a season of our life, most of us who are here today, where you didn't have a camera with you all the time. Unless you were a photographer, you didn't carry a camera around with you. So there were so many things that happened in our day-to-day -day life that we never captured because we didn't have a camera in our pocket. Now with smartphones, we all have a camera 24-7, and we capture so many of life's events. And the camera in my smartphone is probably one of the greatest features or my favorite features of a smartphone. Uh, it's definitely not texting. It's definitely not social media. It's definitely not even the phone capability. I could go without that, I think. Like, that would be perfectly fine if no one ever called me or texted me again, right? But the camera is really cool. It's cool to be able to pull out their camera when your kids are doing something for the first time or something special, just to snap a camera. And then you can open that photo and you can scroll through your photos for previous years. Anyone else do this? You scroll through your photos and you have a favorites folder of all your favorites photo. And, and anyone like to do this? You know what I'm doing? What am I doing right here? I'm zooming, right? I'm zooming in on these photos because I want to see certain parts of these photos more, more magnified. I'm magnifying certain features of this photo because I want to see this photo. And how cool of a feature is that that we can do on our smartphone? Anyone else done this? Has anyone looked at a paper photo recently and, and, and tried to zoom in on it? Anyone done that? I've done that. Like in the, in, in the most recent month, someone hand me a photo or a picture out of a magazine and I would do that. I'm like, what the heck am I doing, right? Like we're so custom now to these devices that we can zoom in on pictures like that. That was never an option before, you know? Um, but you know what? We zoom in on things and maybe you zoom in if you find a really good picture of your bride or whatever that is, you zoom in and then you can crop it where she's just kind of filling the whole picture, right? And you know, and it's like, man, I'm magnifying this picture because it's worthy of, of being magnified. And I want to share a photo with you guys. So check this out. This is a photo. Uh, me and a couple of the guys, this is Pastor Will, Pastor Travis. Back in April, uh, we traveled out to Texas to visit a friend's church and an event that was going on in the Fort Worth area. And when we got to the airport in Fort Worth, Dallas-Fort Worth Airport, we said, hey, the first thing we're going to do before we even look up directions to the church is we're going to find some Texas barbecue. The first thing we're doing off this plane is finding Texas barbecue. So we found this place in, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area called Terry Black's. And if you're ever in that area, you need to find Terry Black's. It's an incredible barbecue joint. And this kind of snapped a picture of two strapping, handsome men right there, Pastor Will, Pastor Travis, repping his Grove swag, sitting in this incredible barbecue restaurant with just a really, really, really good atmosphere, all of the food, the service, everything was great. And this picture kind of... Uh, uh, it, it, it captures all of that in the moment. And I look at that picture and remember, man, that was a good day. That was a whole lot of fun. But check it out. What's really worthy of being magnified? What, what the greatest thing in this picture that needs to be magnified and needs to be brought to the attention uh, before everything else is this next picture. Check this out. That, <laughs> that is one massive beef rib, all right? That is one rib. So when you order ribs, you don't order ribs at Terry Black's. You order a rib, singular. That's a beef rib. 
Now, when you look at that picture, maybe you didn't notice it in that first picture, but when you magnify and you zoom in, now the thing that's most valuable and most important in that picture comes to the front. It's worthy of being magnified. And now, you know what happened? Our view was consumed with what was most worthy, what was most worthy of being magnified. But what happened to Will and Travis? They're pushed out of the picture. They're not even in the picture anymore, right? What happened to all of the other surrounding things in that photo? They're no longer there. And, and I share this with you to share this. When we magnify God, when we learn to magnify God, so many other things in our life that are maybe fighting for our attention, that are maybe acting as distractions in our life, when we zoom in and we magnify the person of God in our life, everything else falls out of the scene. And God becomes the central point of our focus because he's the only one worthy of being magnified. He's the only one worthy of consuming our, our, our view and our image is the person of God. You know, God is so much bigger and worthy of our focus and attention than anything else. I love what it says in Isaiah 55. It says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. I mean, God is so supreme. He's ruling and reigning above everything. You know, and, and if we're going to have this other's first attitude, the first thing we got to get into perspective is that we learn to magnify God, that he is the one that's worthy of being magnified, not ourselves. Many of us have a hard time living this out because Guards the view of ourself and our vision is consumed with us. But when we magnize our view of God, it forces us, write this down, to minimize attention to ourself. When we magnize our view of God, it forces us to minimize attention to ourself. In verse 7, Paul writes to the believers in Philippi. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. I, I want you to hear this. He made himself nothing. And maybe we can think of like, like putting ourselves down or, or, or sometimes we have an inaccurate definition of, of humility. And we think humility means lack of self-worth or, or it means something other than what it truly means biblically. And I want you to hear this, that humility or, or thinking less of yourself, it's, it's not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. It's not, a, it's not a lesser image of yourself. It's just thinking of yourself less. It's not allowing your, your view to be consumed uh, with yourself, but it's allowing your view to be consumed with the presence of God and others. We live in a, a self-focused society, and we're encouraged to look out for number one. You guys agree with that? I mean, we hear all types of slogans in our culture of to, to look out for number one. We, you know, hey, treat yourself because you deserve it. How many of you guys hear that on a weekly basis? Treat yourself. You deserve it. You know, uh, anytime you, you deserve it, you've worked hard. And it's like this, this motto in our, in our culture of like, hey, just take care of yourself. Just treat yourself. Don't worry about those around you. You deserve it. You deserve to treat yourself the best you can. And now there might be a hint of truth to that, that we need to care for ourselves, not to neglect ourselves, but it can easily be skewed, right? It can easily be skewed and we can allow ourselves to become the focus of all of our attention, but we need to learn to minimize attention to ourselves. You know, we live in a selfie-focused world. Do you guys know that over 200 million selfies are taken a day? Over 200 million selfies are taken a day. And you guys know what I'm referring to, right? Like the selfies when you see people like posing and using their arms as an extension. And it's, not, it's nothing out of the norm today in 2021 to be in a restaurant, to be on an airplane, to be at the beach, to be in the office, to be in the middle of a meeting. You can be anywhere and people are taking selfies. And I don't mean teenagers. I'm talking about grown adults. I'm talking about grandmas and grandpas. <laughs> taking selfies in public places. And I'm just going to tell you, it's awkward. It's awkward. So if you're addicted to the selfie movement, 
just know everyone's looking at you and you look awkward. You look awkward. And so we're at the beach on Friday and I'm with my family and we're sitting there and this family comes up and they spread out their blanket right next to us. And there is a mom and a dad and two look to be teenage children. And the mom gets her stuff all set down and, and she turns her back to the water and she begins to do a photo shoot with herself, a selfie, not the teenagers, the mom. And I'm just thinking, this is the weirdest phenomenon ever. What are you doing with those photos? You know, like turn the camera around and take a picture of your kids for Lord's sake, right? Like, why are you snapping pictures of yourself? What are you doing with those? But we know what's happening with those. There's a, there's a social media craze, right? And we're looking for acceptance and we're looking for recognition. And so we're going to find everything we can to post pictures of ourselves and let everyone know how awesome of a day we're having. And if we're having a crappy day, we're still going to smile on our selfie and we're going to pretend like everything's okay because it's on social media. And we want everyone to know how good our life is. And we want to compare our highlight reel to everyone else's blooper reel. Let me post a selfie. We live in this, this crazy phenomenon of, of, of social media and selfies, and what it really represents is we're just consumed with ourselves. But if we're going to live in others' first attitude, if we're going to embrace this value, we got to learn to minimize attention to ourselves. We got to learn to maximize our view of God and minimize our attention to ourselves. If we're going to ever see the needs of others, we got to have to stop looking at ourselves for a bit. And others' first attitude makes it less about us and more about him and more about them. I love the way that John says it in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 30. He says, I must decrease and he must increase. What an incredible passage of Scripture, right? That's probably one to, to memorize there. I must decrease and he must increase. Whatever's going on in my day, it needs to be less about me and more about him if I'm going to live out this value of putting the interests of others before my own. Have you guys ever met someone who constantly deflects attention from themselves to God and to others, where it's less about them and it's more about God? This is a practice that I'm trying to teach my 10-year-old son, and we just came out of baseball season, and he was getting a lot of compliments from his coaches and from, from other parents, and, and, and it's good. You know, I'm glad that people are recognizing and seeing that and complimenting him, but, but as I walk away from him to get into the truck, I said, hey, bud, do you know what it means to deflect attention? To deflect attention means, hey, you can receive a compliment. You can say, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, coach. But you can deflect it by saying, you know, it wouldn't be possible without an incredible team. I'm really grateful for my teammates. I'm really grateful for God and the abilities or the talent that he's given me. And what you just did was you received compliments, but at the same time, you've deflected the attention to him and to them. Let us be men that deflect attention not people who are constantly receiving it and hoarding it for ourselves. When we maximize our view of God and we minimize attention to ourselves, then lastly, you can write this down, then we can emphasize the needs of others. In verse 8, Paul goes on to say, and being found in appearance as a man, Jesus, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Man, the ultimate act of service, Jesus emphasizing the needs of others, that he humbled himself, he became obedient to death and even death on a cross. When we make it about others and we deflect attention from ourselves, there's not a lot of public praise. There's not a lot of recognition. But I want you to hear this. We're never more like Jesus than when we serve others. We're never more like Jesus than when we serve others. When I think of someone who models an other's first attitude and constantly emphasizes the needs of others, I can't help but think of, of one of our own, one of our own men here at the Grove, and he would never recognize or, or share about himself, obviously, because, because he's a man of 
humility. But, but when I think about someone who just every time I'm in a conversation with them, there's something being brought up of ways that he can serve either his family or the community or, or someone in the church or a ministry in the church. And I think about my good friend, Josh Gerard. Josh Gerard, some of you guys might know him. Uh, he's, part, he's a partner here at the Grove Church. And Josh serves in so many areas. Josh serves with our men at our Walkabout Recovery Home. Josh serves in our Lifeline mini, Lifeline Recovery Ministry. Josh serves on our facilities team. Josh serves in the student ministry on Wednesday nights. Josh is teaching the fourth, fifth, and sixth graders this morning at the Rise service. And it's not just that he serves all of these ministries at the church. In my daily conversations with Josh, he's serving his wife. He's serving his children. He's serving coworkers. He's serving strangers. Constantly telling me of things, someone he met at the gas station or met on the side of the road and that God just gave him this impression to, to serve and to stop and to help. And this guy embodies what it means to live an others first attitude or life. It's an incredible thing to witness. I'm inspired by him. I'm inspired by his heart to serve. And you know, when I, when I see Josh Gerard, I don't just see someone who loves to serve, but I see an expression of Jesus. Because Jesus, this is what he did, that he humbled himself and he became obedient, dying to his own desires, dying to his own selfish desires, but he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus said this about himself. He says, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. You know, church, Jesus left heaven and came to earth to pay the price for our sins, to, to meet our greatest need. I don't know if you've realized this, but, but humanity had an incredible need. Humanity had an incredible need. Here's what happened, that, that God created humanity. He created man, he created woman, and, and due to their own sin, their own sinful nature, they were separated from God because of their disobedience. And then every single one, one of us, all of humanity throughout history, we were born into this sinful nature, this sinful nature, this natural nature that, that sins against God. For all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. And I know that we can point fingers at Adam and Eve, but if it wouldn't have been them, it would have been you or it would have been me. All have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. And this sin separated us from a holy God. We can have nothing to do with God because he is holy and without sin and can have no interaction with sin. It doesn't change the truth that God is madly in love with you and that God forgives you, but he can have no interaction or relationship with us until that sin is dealt with. This was a massive need. And Jesus, emphasizing the need of humanity, left heaven and came to earth to live the life of a servant, to die the death of a criminal, to pay the price for all of humanity's sins, meeting our need. This is incredible. You know, Jesus didn't have this need. Jesus didn't have a need for his sins to be forgiven because he was the only one who was without sin. Jesus was perfect. He was holy. He was without blemish. He didn't have to pay for his own sin because there was none. But what Jesus did and what he came to do was not for himself, but completely for us. That Jesus willingly went to the cross to cover the price of sins for you and for me. This is what, I re this is what I'm referring to when we have this incredible model of someone who embodied what it means to, to live another's first attitude. That Jesus, even though equality with God could have been grasped, it wasn't. But he humbled himself, making himself a servant, being obedient to death, even death on a cross. Putting the interests of, of others before his own. So that each and every one of us who would come to faith and belief in the person of Jesus and believe that he is who he says he is, that we could be restored back into relationship with God not because of our own goodness, not because of anything we contribute to this, but solely because of the work of Jesus in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection. I love this thought. This is really powerful. The only thing we contribute to the gospel 
The only thing we contribute to this gift of, of salvation is the sin that makes it necessary. We bring nothing else to the table. We bring nothing good to the table. The only thing that I have to offer in and of myself is my sin. And Jesus says, hey, bring me your sin and I'll take it from there. I'm willingly going to go to the cross to die on your behalf, Brad. I'm going to pay the price for your sin. And look what it says in 2 Corinthians. I love this description. It says that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is, this is the great exchange where Jesus says, Brad, give me all of your sin. Give me all of your junk. And I'm going to take credit for everything that you've ever done wrong. And in trade for that, I'm going to give you all of my righteousness. And I'm going to give you credit for everything that I've ever done right. That's what Jesus did for us on the cross. Is that phenomenal? Give me all of your sin. Just think about that for a moment. Like maybe just think of an inventory of your sin, right? You'd be overwhelmed if you go back more than a few days. An inventory of my sin, much less 42 years, right? To think about, hey, let, let me take all of my sin and let me bring it to the feet of Jesus because he says, I want it. I'm going to take it from you in, in exchange for it, in trade. I'm going to give you all of my righteousness everything that Jesus ever did right, which is everything. And when we make this great exchange and we receive this gift of forgiveness and salvation, we're no longer seen as sinners, but we're seen as righteous. That's what it says in 2 Corinthians, that we might become the righteousness of God because of the works of Jesus. Amen? Man, my prayer for us today, church, as we wrap up our time this morning is that Man, as we, as we embrace and embody, you know, that we don't just go to church. It's not about just what we do on Sundays, but it's how we live our life all week long in our community. May we embrace these, these characteristics of Christ. May we embrace this value and this characteristic of having an other's first attitude. May we walk out of here today and may we walk into our neighborhoods, into our family gatherings tonight, into our workplace tomorrow, and to, to wherever we are going on. And, and may we have this mindset of, man, it's not about me. May life not be consumed with self, but may Jesus, through, through, through your power living and working in me, would you help me see others before myself? Could I, could I embrace an other's first attitude in life? In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. What a great message. We hope that you felt encouraged this week, Grove Church. I don't know where you're at spiritually. Maybe you've been following Jesus for a long time. Maybe you don't know him at all. Maybe you're not quite sure where you sit. It's our number one goal here at the Grove Church to help you take that step into a relationship with Jesus so that way we know that we know Jesus. If you don't know where you're at, if you know you haven't confessed Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want you to go to this link right here. We'll walk you through the gospel very clearly because we want to equip you. We want to help you grow in your faith. We want to see you have that abundant life that Jesus promised. It says in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy but I have come to give you life and life to the fullest. We want to see all of you having that life to the fullest with Jesus. Please go to this link right here. That way we can help you step into a relationship with Jesus. Grove Church, thank you so much for how you support the work of ministry financially. It's because of that generosity that we're able to be the hands and feet of Jesus that we need to. We can do the online experience. We can serve our community the way that we do. We can plant more churches. We can cultivate faith. We can do all these things because of your generosity. We have a couple safe and secure ways to give online. You can go to this link right here. And I just want to encourage you to keep on trusting God, knowing that he can do far more with our 10% than we could ever do if we kept our 100. You guys have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.